This is problem 9-76. It is on page 543. Determine the external rate of heat input and power produced by the Stirling cycle of problem 975 when it is repeated 1300 times per minute. So problem 975, an ideal Stirling cycle operates with one kilogram of air between thermal energy reservoirs at 27 and 527 Celsius. The maximum cycle pressure is 2,000 kilopascals and the minimum cycle <coughs> pressure is 100 kilopascals. Determine the network produced uh, each time this cycle is executed and the cycle's thermal efficiency. Now, by way of, of mentioning this, you should mark all the cycles. We just talked about the Brayton cycle. I'd recommend you, you uh, mark the page that has the cycle diagram for the Brayton cycle. Now, I don't see it right off here. Well, anyway, remember to do that. But for now, also mark the page that has the ideal Stirling cycle. It's on page 504. And since the Stirling cycle and the Carnot cycle are both reversible, they put both of these cycles on this page. They also put the Erickson cycle on here, which is also theoretically reversible. Yes, sir? Brayton cycle is on page 508. 508, thank you. Okay, so let's mark that. I think I've got a Brayton cycle problem later. Uh, yeah, I've got one later, but it's with regeneration. So go ahead and mark page 508 so you've got the Brayton cycle, but also mark page 504. And I'm going to copy the Sterling cycle uh, diagram. So the TS diagram, what you'll find is that the TS diagrams typically end up being more important than the PV diagrams. We start with PV diagrams because that's what students really seem to understand but quickly move to the TS diagram. So let's see, I don't have the Sterling cycle memorized like I do the others. So here's state four, state one, state two, state three. Here's Q in, Q out, constant volume, Uh, work processes, or no, regeneration, excuse me. And then the PV diagram looks like this. Let's see. Four to one for the regeneration, the constant volume regeneration. Uh, QN occurs here, one to two. And this is constant temperature, which you can see from up here. over a bit. There's three, here's Q out. Okay, let's see, of course this is a constant temperature uh, heat rejection process. And that should be enough for these cycle diagrams to solve this. Okay, so what do we have? Well, we have the maximum pressure, which is at state one. Um, as 2,000 kilopascals, and then the minimum pressure at state three of 100 kilopascals. Okay, we've also got the low temperature uh, at 27 Celsius, which is 300 Kelvin, and the high temperature at uh, 527, which is 800 Kelvin. Okay, so notice the temperatures at 1 and 2 are the same, at 3 and 4 are the same. Okay, we've also got 1300 thermodynamic cycles per minute. So we're going to have 1300 times however much work this cycle produces. Okay, all right, so let's go through this. The total work would be the mass times the specific work. And so where, where is work done? Well, from state one to state two, work is put out, right, during heat addition. And then from three to four, work is put in. You can tell that because under the PV diagram, only one to two and three to four have area. So we know that only one to two and three to four have um, uh, work. So if I wanted to calculate the net work output, I would need to calculate the net work done. 
and that would be the work done from state one to two less the work that I have to put in from three to four. Okay? <coughs> now, so both of these are isothermal boundary work. What does that mean? Well, that means the work from state one to state two com could be computed as boundary work, PDV, and it comes out to R times TH times the natural logarithm of V2 over V1. Where did this come from? Well, this is just boundary work at constant temperature. Because look, 1 to 2 is a constant temperature process. So we can use our boundary work equation that involves constant temperature. So there it is. Okay. Now, we can also relate state 1 to state 4 as follows. P1, V1 over T1 equals P4, V4 over T4. Why? Because the amount of mass in the system is not changing. Okay. So we can relate those. And since V4 and V1 are equal to each other, then they would cross off. And what we learned from this is that P4 equals T4 over T1 times P1. Notice we have T4. In fact, we have all the temperatures. That means this is pretty much solved. These, like I said, these are pretty easy. We have T4. We have T1. <clears throat> we were given P1, so we can calculate P4. I'm not going to show you all the math on the board. You can see that we can plug in numbers here and get it. In the interest of time, I will just write it down. P4 comes out to 750 kilopascals. Also, we can relate states 2 and 3. The same way. Okay. And since you notice that V2 equals V3, okay, then we could write P2 in terms of the temperatures and the pressure at state 3. Okay. Notice we have T2, T3. We have P3. It's 100 kilopascals. So we can calculate P2. Now I'm going to pull it off this way because my diagram here may not be accurate. Turns out that's 266.7 kilopascals. If you plug in T2, T3, P3, which we have. Okay. Now you see that my diagram's off a little bit because state two should be below state four, but that's why I put it off to the right. Okay. Well, that's all well and good. Does that help us? Well, sure, it helps us quite a lot. We know the pressures and temperatures everywhere, and so we should be able to uh, work on this. So what do we end up with from uh, here, well, we could plug in this idea because notice this idea will work from 3 to 4 as well because it's also a constant temperature process. So we could just replace these as RTH, natural logarithm V2 over V1 for the first work output term. And for work from 3 to 4, we could replace that as RTL, natural logarithm of V4 over V3. Okay, so that's what we really need in order to solve this. Okay? TH and TL are done, that's no problem. Uh, but now it looks like we need the volume. Now, in order to get the volume ratios, V2 over V1, we could relate them by P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. In fact, you can see that you could rearrange this, right? What you'll end up with is uh, T2 over T1, okay? So V2 over V1 will be T2 over T1, okay? I'm sorry, excuse me, T2 over T1 are the same. So you actually end up, I'm trying to go too fast, you actually end up with P1 over P2, sorry. Okay. And if you do the same thing, let's do it consistently, P3, V3 over T3 equals P4, V4 over T4. Again, you notice that between states 3 and 4, what's constant is the temperature. Then for this term, V4 over V3 equals P3 over P4. Now we have all the pressures, right? So this is not too bad. So we can plug in all the numbers to this equation, because of course V2 over V1 will replace by P1 over P2. V4 over V3 will replace by P3 
Well, before you guys should love the Sterling cycle. It's so easy, right? This is simple. We're just using the ideal gas law over and over. Don't expect to do that with every cycle. That usually works with the Sterling cycle. Okay, now this is a lot to plug in. We're going to plug in one kilogram here. The gas constant for uh, air could be brought out. It's just a constant. It's 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. TH and TL, you're going to plug those in in absolute units. Okay, and we have all the pressures, P1, P2, P3, and P4. We've already solved for those. So anyway, to answer the question, how much net work is done? When you plug all that in, it's a mess. I'll show it to you on the video camera as well. It's, uh, let's see, right down here. It's all of that. It goes across the entire page. You have to be careful. Make sure you ca uh, cancel your units properly. But the net work ends up being 289.1 kilojoules. Now this is the amount of work out from one cycle, okay? The question also is what's the thermal efficiency? Well that's the work output divided by Qn, and by an energy balance from 1 to 2, we could say that uh, Qn minus the boundary work from 1 to 2, because remember boundary work is occurring as heat's being added, that's equal to the internal energy change from 1 to 2, okay? Now, the internal energy at 2 and 1 are actually the same, so this is just 0. So what that means is that Qn is the same as the work from 1 to 2. See how easy all this stuff falls out? So this is just the work output divided by the work output from 1, or the work, uh, yeah, output from 1 to 2. We've already got this uh, here, and we've got this if we break them up. So this ends up being 289.1 kilojoules. And if you calculate just essentially this piece, this is the work from state one to state two, that's 462.6 kilojoules. That's the total work output, not the net. So this comes out to 62.5%. Now, I want you to do this one part. I want you to calculate the thermal efficiency of a reversible heat engine working between these same temperature limits, 300 over 800. What do you get? 165. It's exactly what we expected, right? It's exactly this. That's because this is ideally a completely reversible cycle. Okay. At 1300 cycles per minute, then all we have to do is multiply the network output by, because that's the work per cycle. Okay, we could make it a work per cycle, but that's understood because we've just solved one cycle. Okay, so the work out uh, per time, in other words, the power output, would be 1,300 cycles per minute multiplied by the 289.1 kilojoules per cycle. on this mess here. Okay. And so we have kilojoules per minute. You can convert that to kilowatts. It turns out to be 6.26 megawatts. So this is a pretty good size engine. Okay? Questions, comments? All right, that's it. Thank you.